everybody has heard of him. New, new Holland tractors came to India with acquisition of few tractor manufacturing companies. Now it's a Fiat group. Now the Fiat group is managing New Holland tractors. They have a spread. And this is Bangladesh and to observe the International Crime Tribunal in January of this year. Uh, I had the, the fortune and the pleasure of meeting Ambassador Rapp, and I had the fortune and pleasure of meeting the equivalent to the Bangladesh Minister of Justice on a number of occasions to discuss these issues. I have made my recommendations bearing in mind uh, I'm representing the defence, I'm not an independent uh, observer. That's quite clear. But certainly I've given my advice on the basis of my experience of having been involved in setting up a tribunal, a domestic tribunal in Bosnia. Ambassador Rapp has given his recommendations on what changes should be made. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the International Centre for Transitional Justice, the International Bar Association, the all party parliamentary committee on human rights of this country have all made very strong recommendations for changes that need to be made. To date, none of those changes have been implemented or even considered. Whilst these proceedings are ongoing, one of the most worrying aspects of all of this is that of those currently in custody, they are all members of the opposition parties. The legislation as it stands effectively prohibits anyone from the liberation forces from ever being prosecuted. So only one side of the conflict will ever be, be brought to account. Now the controversy is suggesting that any member of the liberation forces committed a crime. It is of course up to the prosecutor through its own selected criteria to determine what cases to bring. The impunity gap is not a legitimate reason um, or a, a legitimate argument to raise in this regard because there is prosecutorial discretion on what cases to bring. But when the legislation explicitly excludes any prosecution on the other side, this of course causes perceived problems. There are a number of other concerns that we have raised with the tribunal, as Bangladesh is a signatory to not only the International Criminal, uh, the Rome Statute, but also to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We the brother, and the reason is, I think, completely. I would here is a live example of corporate governance. If you see the trust of people, the trust of people in the shares of Reliance as well as in Tata, they have more trust in the Tata company rather than in Reliance. If you, if, let's say Tata and Reliance, if they both launch a water bottle, and if I ask any general public who, which one you will buy, people will buy the Tata rather than the Reliance because they have created that image. They created the corporate governance that, that this company is trustworthy. Reliance may give more bonus, they will give more uh, dividend, but certainly that trust cannot be created. It, it is basically exercise if you follow with all your employees, with your stakeholders, with your vendors, with other parties, those who are related to the company, this can be created. And same goes with the country. Within the country, you have the people, you, you have the, the judiciary, you have the bureaucrat, you have the politician. So this is a big exercise. But certainly India is trying to, you know, uh, come up on that and trying to make sure what again believe in that. Recently, uh, a little bit credit rating has gone down, but they are trying to do it. I'll give you some other example the group called James Group from Dubai. They run approximately 100 schools across the world. And they have taken Tony Blair, they have taken Bill Clinton on their board, particularly to make sure the corporate governance issue, they do free charity. Every year they donate $30 million for the poorest children across <coughs> the world. So they are trying to set up example on the corporate governance side. So uh, I will say uh, this much about that. And then again, I will say th the rule of corporate governance is very, very important to improve the company as well as the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vijay Gwil. Uh, friends, any questions on this subject? Mr. Vijay Goyal is already here.
Yeah, please. Um, I was at a conference last week when the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority were in attendance and um, they introduced this idea that all the law firms in the UK are going to have to have compliance officers who will be a lawyer. And um, the gasps in the room weren't necessarily from the big city firms or the, the bigger firms, it was from the, the one-man high street firms who were saying, what? You know, I've now got to become a compliance officer uh, as well as being a lawyer, as well as running a business, as well as running the IT system. And um, it, you just got the feeling that, yes, I mean, I agree with compliance, I agree with governance, I agree with everything that you were talking about, Peter, particularly with regard to IT. But um, my goodness, is there, is there a danger you're going to make life too difficult for the SME stroke one man mm. firm? Yeah. Are we sort of suppressing entrepreneurialship? <coughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, song? Yeah. It's a, no, it's a very interesting point actually because, um, yeah, I mean the, the tension between having the right level of oversight of you know, the, the obvious risks that can come into any organisation and law firms are no exception, um, but also allowing the, the smaller organisation, you know, the, the SME or the, the one man band, the, the sole practitioner, the ability to not get not spend all their time worrying about all of these regulations is um, is is a particularly acute one uh, in this area. You, you've, I, I don't think um, I mean I don't think there's any easy solution. I mean for the for the sole practitioner who has to grapple with the the new regulations coming into controlling solicitors in in this this country, um, I, I imagine that you will certainly hope that the uh, the SRA will take a you know, a, 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 a considered view, if you like, uh, when they're when they're looking at smaller firms, because to be honest, even among the larger firms, the the level of understanding about what was required, about what they had to do, was very minimal up until about two months ago. And, and um, I mean, certainly in in my firm, in Lawrence Graham, we're, we've only you know we've been having meetings and talking to our risk partner about some of the issues that we'll need to now deal with as a, as a partnership. Um, yeah, but we're a, we're a law firm of, you know, 230-odd lawyers, and, you know, but, you know, and we have the, the resources, the infrastructure to deal with it. Similarly, uh, in financial services, you, you know, large organizations, large banks, you would hope um, have the resources there to, to comply with fairly similar rules and regulations. It gives rise to a debate of language. Previous speaker, referred to this, how do we define terrorism? This is a debate which is in many ways arid. Uh, it doesn't really help us progress matters very much because there is no universally accepted definition. We come close to it, but rarely these terms are given content with a view to justifying a particular end. And they'll be given content in different countries in slightly different ways and in UN instruments in slightly different ways. So you can do with language what you like. The role of the legal philosopher, of the linguistic philosopher, is often ignored by lawyers and legal systems. Or simply sidelined, because they simply use the language the way they want to in order to justify a particular end. These things have very draconian practical consequences. Fourthly, it has led to derogations and which have served them so well for centuries, it's not as if terrorism is a new concept. Or to abandon those and try to uh, have derogations into them in order to accommodate a short-term perceived threat. Terrorism is probably not as lost out by no means belittle it. It has serious consequences. It is by no means as much of a threat as climate change is to the number of lives it will claim. Fifthly, it has led to a re-examination, at the very least, of the interrelationship with international humanitarian law and international human rights law. This again is not simply an arid dispute. This is the sort of area which has led to people recharacterizing the language that is used in these instruments in order to say, well, X is a prisoner of war, Y isn't, 
x is a local competent, y isn't. And this is then used in order to justify detention. With that very brief uh, set of bullet points, let me uh, simply set out the two broad areas where I think there has been a um, significant practical impact. One is in the area of detention, particularly of preventive, preventive detention. The second is in the area of fair trial rights. So far as detention is concerned, there have been many different forms of detention used and preventive detention also. Some of this has, for example, involved multi in, in various legal systems, and I focus on no one in particular, as I said. In, it has involved the creation of offenses which criminalize a range uh, of, 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 of conduct and does it on the basis of multiple layers of suspicion. A reasonable suspicion that an individual is involved with a group, which itself needs definition, which itself is suspected of being involved in uh, carrying out actions uh, uh, against sections of the community. Multiple layers of suspicions are built in into definitions which then start entering onto statute books as criminal offences. All of this used in order to justify powers of arrest and detention to a broader category of persons. <coughs> Similarly, the debate, although we haven't had it so much here, that is the debate that I mentioned a moment ago about prisoner of war status and non prisoner of war status, something which we haven't had to deal with so much because our armed forces haven't been so directly involved with it, but in the US, because of one time a they've had to deal with it much more head <coughs> on. And what uh, they have begun to do is to shift the boundaries of the power of detention by recharacterizing the language uh, and redefining the language in these in, in, in international instruments. So that's quite large scale uh, uh, detention. Another aspect of this of these detention regimes is not criminal it's not in the criminal field at all, and I've not said by any means anywhere near enough about the criminal field, but because of lack of time, I'll keep the comments short. Another field is that which uh, deals with immigration, rendition, and extradition. I take these things together. In the United States, immigration powers were the first powers that were used in order to avoid criminal detentions and to detain foreign nationals, it didn't deal with homegrown threats, as we the problem that we had here, um, <coughs> but was capable of dealing with threats caused by um, foreign national te uh, suspected terrorists. Because the state in international law has a sovereign right to control the entry of aliens, the immigration field has given us carte blanche uh, to uh, states in order to, under the guise of immigration powers, control the activities of people who may, whilst not having the nationality of the state in which they're living, may have been settled there for long, long periods, possibly generations, to control their lives. Detention powers of such persons are virtually There is a limit, but they're virtually limitless. In this country, uh, following on from Article 5.1.F of the European Convention of Human Rights, the limit is simply um, the point at which it becomes unrealistic, uh, at the point at which there is no realistic prospect of being able to remove somebody. So long as there is a realistic prospect of being able to remove somebody from this country, you're able to keep them in detention. <coughs> Not that. It, it, uh, all this happens, but uh, it, it has happened quite a lot. The extradition field also is a field in which we've had similar problems. Uh, 